Britain's steaming giants take centre stage now as Richard Whiteley remembers 4468, the record breaker. The year 1825 and the steam engine locomotion puffs its way at a stately speed of 15 bone-shaking miles an hour. It was the start of the railways as we now know them, and the start of a quest for speed which has marked the history of rail travel. Many remarkable achievements have been recorded, and many legends have been created. But one steam locomotive stands supreme as a world beater, Mallard. Four six eight, the record breaker. From their very beginning, the railways offered a speed of transfer that was unmatched. As far back as 1829, Stevenson's rocket achieved a speed of 29 miles an hour, amid fears that such a high speed could destroy the human body. But the public loved speed, despite the lack of passenger comfort. And this onboard jazz band was definitely an optional extra. On normal runs, those early pioneering passengers had to brave the elements, standing up in open wagons. And it wasn't just travelling in the wagons that took courage. Getting in and out of them could be quite a task, especially if you were a lady wearing a long Victorian skirt. By the end of the 19th century, trains had reached speeds which those early travellers would probably have considered to be as likely as flying to the moon. One of the principal reasons for this was the intense, indeed at times ferocious, rivalry between the East and West Coast lines. They were vying for the fastest run between London and Edinburgh, the race to the north. August 1888 was when that rivalry first developed into outright racing. And in those early days, with engines like this Stirling eight-footer, it was the East Coast which won hands down. During the summer of 1888, the competition was so intense that the normal travelling time between London and Edinburgh was brought down from nine hours to an amazing seven hours, 27 minutes, and that included a stop for lunch. For a time, an uneasy truce was called. And then, in 1895, the daggers were drawn again. That year, this engine, Hardwick, created one of the milestones in the history of the railways and brought the West Coast firmly back into contention. On the night of August the 22nd, Hardwick completed the 141 miles between Crewe and Carlisle in 126 minutes. The average speed on the journey had been 67.2 miles an hour. The mile a minute average had been emphatically smashed and it was a record that was to stand for decades. But the beginning of this century was to see a spectacular and indeed controversial speed run, which ironically had nothing to do with the race to the north. In 1904, Great Western Railways claimed that this engine, City of Truro, had reached a speed of 102.3 miles an hour on the route between Plymouth and Bristol. With no way at the time to verify the speed, there were many who publicly doubted the record claim. But despite the controversy, City of Truro had assured herself of a page in railway history. And she certainly became the centre of considerable interest. In fact, the company banned all immediate publicity on the city of Truro's remarkable run. Apparently, they thought it would make the other passengers nervous. But that attitude changed 19 years later when they launched the Cheltenham Flyer to Paddington. The Flyer was scheduled to average 61.8 miles an hour for the trip, making it, for a time, the fastest train in the world. The reputation of Britain's railways was second to none, and the pride taken by the men was envied the world over. Everything had to be done by hand, and every bit of machinery had to be checked, oiled and polished to perfection. And in 1934, 
That sort of attention to detail was to pay handsome dividends for the LNER with a locomotive called the Flying Scotsman. In November that year, taking advantage of the long straight line down Stoke Summit, the Scotsman reached 100 miles an hour and a new British speed record had been officially created. The 1930s saw a surge in rail speed and it was the LNER which dominated events. Their chief engineer, Nigel Gresley, had captured the public's imagination and support with his streamlined A4 locomotives. Engines like Silver Link and Silver Fox pushed the speed record up to 113 miles an hour. And the spirit of the age was typified by this spectacular stunt. The rivalry between the various companies was just as fierce on the production line. The entire engine, from the massive wheels down to the smallest of washers, was manufactured and fitted under the same roof. Even if it was a fairly large roof, as at the LMS plant in Crewe. Many famous engines came through these doors as the LMS sought revenge. And in 1937, driver Tom Clark and fireman Jack Lewis waited in the cab of the brand new streamlined designed Coronation Scott. Despite the lack of a decent speed stretch on the West Coast line, the LMS were determined to take up the challenge of their LNER rivals. And in June that year, they were out to succeed. 100 journalists and railway officials took part in a test run from Euston to Crewe and back that provided such an orgy of speed as has never before been indulged in over LMS metals. Until nearing crew in the down direction, the running, though excellent, was kept to schedule. But at Whitmore, driver Clark let her have the throttle. From 85 miles an hour, the speed rose quickly to 100. Faster yet and faster, eating up the miles. 102, 105, 108, and she's still accelerating. The rhythm of the exhaust grows stronger, faster. 112.5 miles an hour for two miles, smoothly surging over the metals. A supreme effort. And Coronation has done it, 114 miles an hour, the highest speed yet attained in the Empire. Unfortunately, that record was broken just two miles out of Crewe Station, and those next two miles were to be a journey never to be forgotten by the terrified passengers. The train was still doing over 50 miles an hour as it approached the station. The wheels were locked, and for those waiting to greet the train, it looked like triumph was to turn into disaster. Eventually, amidst a screeching of brakes and with flames shooting from the wheels, the Coronation Scott did come to a halt on this platform. And for those people standing here 51 years ago, it was a day never to be forgotten. We saw it approaching, coming round the reverse curves of South Junction there, and were absolutely certain that the thing was going to be derailed. So let me assure you that by the time that train stopped, I was running faster than the train was going because I thought that certainly it was going to come to grief. We could see fire flying, sparks flying from his brake blocks quite a distance. And was there any doubt in your mind that he wouldn't stop? Well, my mate and I, said, my mate, he's dead and gone, but he was a, one of the best drivers I ever did fire for. He says, good God, he's not going to stop. And we thought that. And the other thing that I remember is that when the train did come to a halt, there was a tremendous noise of broken crockery. Obviously, any crockery in the train had departed from the table and ended up on the floor in bits and pieces. What sort of state was the driver in? Well, at first, he, he didn't seem very happy. And uh, my mate said to him, Tommy, he says, what did you feel like then? He says, bloody awful. There was tremendous elation because I think everyone had realised that uh, something had happened, that uh, this speed limit had been broken. And so there were tremendous congratulations, although of course, it had to be confirmed later. Uh, but I'm pretty certain that everyone on the train knew that they had gone at a speed greater than any other steam locomotive had travelled prior to then. Back at Euston, Coronation's designer, William Stanier, was on the platform to congratulate Tom Clark and Jack Lewis. But for Jack, that ride in the cab of Coronation was to change his life. He never again rode on the footplate as a fireman. He went to Bletchley as a porter. And... Uh, 
and he finished his time as far, as far as I know at Bletchley. So he never worked as a fireman again? Not to my knowledge. Why not? Well, he, he wasn't, he didn't just, uh, he just didn't uh, pass the medical. You see, uh, his uh, physical condition seemed to be affected somehow because he didn't go, he didn't go as a fire, mainline fireman again. But the smiles of William Stanier were to be short-lived. His great rival at LNER, Nigel Gresley, had his own plans, and he had the enthusiastic backing of his men at the world-famous Doncaster Railway plant. Here, men of brawn and brain toil among the flying sparks and in the overpowering heat. And as the white-hot metal is poured into the moulds, a new engine starts its life. In this industry, men and machines combine to produce speed and efficiency. Accuracy plays a vital part in all engineering work. Gears must be cut to a thousandth part of an inch. The slightest flaw means a reject. But in these workshops, good workmanship is the byword. And everything from the smallest screw to the largest boiler is made here. The sparks from the electric arc welder fly high into the air like a firework gala, while the machine welds the various parts together at lightning speed. And in another shop, the acetylene welders are at work in their weird masks, giving the scene an almost eerie atmosphere. As the boilers are assembled, the engine gradually takes shape, but there is still a lot more to be done. All the different departments work in harmony with each other. Our railway stock is renowned the world over, and the fellows in these shops jealously guard their reputation for good craftsmanship and efficiency. But it wasn't just between the British companies that railway rivalry was thriving. Competition was increasing abroad. In 1935, Germany produced a steam engine of 464, which created a new world record speed of 124 miles an hour. It was an impressive and awe-inspiring sight. Back in England, that record was under threat. In 1938, what was to become one of the most famous locomotives of all time prepared to try and break the world steam record, engine 4468 Mallard. The actual record-breaking run itself was attempted in conditions of great secrecy, but one carriage in the 240-ton train gave an important clue. It was this, the dynamometer car. Well, this sort of vehicle can be used for testing just about any type of performance that you want to measure, in, or at least you wanted to measure in the old steam, in the old steam locomotive days. Um, anything from, from fuel consumption, steam temperature, and of course speed. But I suspect what they were mostly concentrating on was, the, was what the so-called ninth wheel, which could be lowered onto the track. You would move this handle here, drop the wheel onto the track. That would immediately touch the rail surface generate current and according to the rotation speed would indicate very accurately how fast you were going and eventually it would end up as a trace on the table. When this was first built then, was it the latest in high tech? Yes, it's very solidly Edwardian. It was built in 1906, which is, oddly enough, only two years after the City of Truro record of 1904. So it's almost exactly contemporary with that very first burst. Um, the amazing thing is that 30 years after it was built, it was still technically good enough to record the world speed record for a steam engine. Chosen to make that record-breaking attempt were fireman Tom Bray and fellow Yorkshireman driver Joe Duddington. The date, Sunday, July the 3rd, 1938. The speedometer in the dynamometer car went up to 120 miles an hour. But by the time Mallard passed this stretch at Stoke Summit, it was already topping that speed and still accelerating. The British record had been broken, but the world record was still in the sights of driver Joe Duddington. Go on, old girl, I thought we can do better than this. So I nursed her and shot through a little bathroom at 123. And in the next one and a quarter miles, the needle crept up further. 123 and a half, 124, 125. And then for a quarter of a mile, while they tell me the folks in the car held their breaths, 126 miles per hour. 126, that was the fastest speed a steel locomotive had ever been driven in the world. My mate, Tommy Bray, 
You've done it, you blighter. I was happy to know the faith I had in Mallard was justified. She answered every call I made on her. She couldn't have done better in the St. Ledger. Because of the secrecy, relatively few people had witnessed that record run. But one man who did was Walter Adams, who at that time was working as a lamp boy at Little Bytham Station. As it came down the line, you could see uh, the swaying of the engine. And you could tell it was coming at quite a good uh, speed. And uh, it, as it went through the station, the uh, coal was dropping off the tender and hitting on the, on the bouncing and on the platform. It's like uh, pieces of shrapnel and stuff. You know? And then it, as it went through the station oh, and disappeared out of sight, uh, we just watched it and thought, well, we never thought we'd seen history being made there. You know? Mallard had taken the world record, but at a price. The engine was unable to continue her scheduled run beyond Peterborough. But when she did return to King's Cross, it was a time to pose for photographs where the smile said it all. A new world steam record had been set, and it's one which still stands today. Even half a century later, the appearance of Mallard is guaranteed to bring out the crowds. And that was certainly the case in July this year, when 50 years to the day that she broke that world record, Mallard was back on the tracks at Doncaster. For those crowding every vantage point and for those invited guests on board, it was to be a journey of pure nostalgia. Especially so for Janet Delaney, granddaughter of Mallard's record-breaking driver, Joe Duddington. He, he always thought of Mallard as being his own baby. It was really... It's just, a, it's just part of the family, as the Mallard. It's, I really feel proud to be a part of this celebration. It's, it's just wonderful. <laughs> really touched. And just to see all the people. I just couldn't believe that so many people are interested in the Mallard. <laughs> stop York and completing the connection with that run 50 years ago Tom Bray son and namesake of Mallard's fireman. I didn't know anything about it till the next morning when I went to work. I was an apprentice at the time. My brother was at school he was at grammar school and the first thing I knew about it was when the lads asked me if this was my dad on front page. He kept it they kept it dead secret and then when I got home there were reporters from national papers there and uh, and yes, I, and then I started asking questions and he told me all about it. He said that he'd definitely gone 130 and Joe Dullington, the driver said so, but they was coming to a junction and they got orders to cut off. I think they were frightened they might leave the rails. Mallard was to prove the pinnacle of the steam era. In the following years, the romance of steam gave way to diesel and then to electric power. But for those who built, ran and indeed travelled in the trains, the urge for speed remained. This was particularly so in post-war Europe, where there developed an intense rivalry between the French and the Germans. This was a battle which for 35 years was won by the French. 
By 1955, the French had taken the world record, and that year the same train created another milestone in the history of rail speed. It became the first in the world to break the 200 mile an hour barrier. Sparks were literally flying as it reached 205.6 miles an hour. And the French weren't finished yet. In 1981, they achieved 236 miles an hour with this TGV electric loco. It looked exactly what it was, a train built for speed. The French were understandably ecstatic. But earlier this year, the Germans finally had cause for celebrations of their own. This intercity experimental train reached a world record speed of 254 miles an hour. It was a speed those early rail travellers would not so much have dreamt about as had nightmares over. Meanwhile, for British Rail, the target today is not so much breaking world speed records as survival with competition from road and from air. And, of course, the ever-increasing threat of privatisation looming larger on the horizon. And this is the engine BR Hope will ensure that future. The GEC-designed Class 91 Electra now undergoing final trials on the East Coast Line. Within a matter of months, BR hoped to have a full high-speed Electra service running between London and Leeds, virtually a year ahead of schedule. It may not have the glamour of steam, but in terms of speed, stamina and technology, it's a train designed for the 90s and beyond. So after a lifetime in the railways now, on various levels, ending up as a senior manager, um, do you think the railway now is in a better shape or worse shape? I don't mean politically, but just as, a, as an operation. There are many things about the modern railway of today that are far in advance of the railway that I joined in 1936. Uh, it's a cleaner railway, it's a more effective railway in that I think um, its recognition of the passenger being the important part of the railway is greater now than perhaps it was then. Uh, but of course, the railways have taken on a different mantle. In those days, of course, uh, transport wasn't for everyone as it is today. Uh, and I think that the railway has a future. And will there always be a quest for speed? Do you think that uh, the managers of the present day railway and the managers of the railway of the future will no, always I, want speed? I don't really think that speed is the only ingredient uh, to the making of a good railway. I think that punctuality and cleanliness um, and a recognition of how much people can pay for their journey, they are also important facets to an effective and hopefully successful railway system. And leaving aside the political innuendos of privatisation or possible privatisation, do you think if, that, if in fact did happen and we had rival competing companies, that would only be good for the technical development of the railway? Well, uh, again, one has to look at the historic perspective. If the company, we private or public, can afford to invest in research and development, then it will do so because it gets a jolly good commercial return. That's why they built these things a hundred years ago, to get a commercial return out of them. The, the modern enthusiasts likes to look at the, the polished brass and all the rest of it, but these were workhorses earning dividends. And frankly, that the principle doesn't seem to me to have changed. Whatever the future holds, for many, the excitement and magic of the age of the train is personified in one locomotive, engine 4468 Mallard. Quite simply, the fastest steam engine in the world.